Hi, welcome to the Northeast Risk Management Network webinar uh, entitled Managing Up and Coming Invasives in the Northeast, Milamin Weed. Uh, we're fortunate to have two presenters here with us today, um, Ellen Lake and Kevin Freiberger. And they're going to talk about two topics that came up as high interest in the risk network survey um, conducted in 2018 and published in, in 2020. And those two topics are, are species that are expected to expand their ranges in the Northeast with climate change. Um, and Milo minuteweed in particular was identified as a species of high interest. Um, and then also biocontrol and um, how biocontrol efficacy might change with climate change. And so our presenters today will, will touch on um, some aspects of both of those, certainly mile a minute and some aspects of biocontrol for that species. Um, by way of brief intro, um, Ellen Lake is a research entomologist at the USDA ARS Invasive Plant Research Lab in Fort Lauderdale. Um, she completed her undergraduate work at Bryn Mawr College and doctoral work at the Univers University of Delaware. Um, and she has 16 years of experience uh, with research on bio biological control of invasive weeds, um, myelin in it being one of those. Um, Kevin Freiberger is a natural resource manager at the Brandywine Conservancy in Devon, Pennsylvania, and holds bio both biology and environmental science degrees. Um, Kevin is responsible for the management of the natural areas that are owned by the Brandywine Conservancy, um, including invasive species management, habitat restoration, scientific research, um, educational programs, and more um, that support the, the goals of the Conservancy. And he's had considerable experience working with Mile a Minute um, on the Conservancy properties. So without further ado, let's join um, the first presentation um, provided by Ellen Lake that is in progress. And I wanted to say how important the input from Kevin and other land managers was particularly early on in this process in helping to define research goals and questions in ways that would have useful management implications. And Kevin and the Brandywine Conservancy hosted a number of the research projects that I'll be talking about today. So Mila Minute Weed, Persicaria perfoliata, formerly Polygonum perfoliatum, is an annual invasive vine of Asian <coughs> Uh, we call this picture the uh, Snoopy on the doghouse topiary. And uh, this weed can outcompete native plants in a variety of habitats. This climbing habit is assisted by backward projecting thorns present on the main stems, the leaf petioles, and the midribs. Again, this is an annual, and uh, this is critical to management because it forms a seed bank that can persist for at least six years. So during the course of the summer, you start to see these fruit clusters develop with green fruits that turn this distinct blue color as they mature. Each of those fruits contains a single akene. So the plant is killed by frost in the fall and seeds will just shed off of those plants and the following spring, you can get a carpet of seedlings below what, where you had an infestation the previous year. Alternatively, seed can be spread by animals. So you might get a cluster that's completely missing here. And it can also be spread by water and be viable in water for about a week. Mile a Minute Weed was first introduced to the US in the 1930s in South Central Pennsylvania in York County. Uh, it arrived as a contaminant of a shipment of holly seed from Japan. Again, this weed has a, a wide uh, distribution in the native range in Asia. You can see it, the current range in the US includes 14 states, and it became apparent pretty early on that uh, this was going to be a problem to manage, and it was causing problems in tree plantings, and that encouraged the Forest Service to initiate a biological control program in 1996 that ultimately led to the release of the weevil Rhinoconomus latipes in 2004, which happens to be the year that I joined Judy Huff Goldstein's lab group. So for those who are not familiar with biological control, the million dollar question is always, is it safe? 
Well, the, the theory about invasive weeds, the leading theory is that these weeds become problematic. They explode and grow unchecked because they arrive without any of the natural enemies that limit their growth in the native range. So biological control seeks to reestablish that top-down control by reuniting the invasive plant with co-evolved specialist, and that's the key, specialist insect herbivores or plant pathogens from the native range. Think about how a monarch specializes on milkweed. There's an extensive testing process and a multi-agency regulatory review that takes place prior to the approval of any new biological control agents. And it's important to note that these invasive plants are never eradicated. The goal is to reduce their impact on native communities and reduce the level of management required to keep them in control. So to give you a visual on this, uh, I'd like to think of plant species as having chemical fingerprints that are unique to them, like our fingerprints are unique to us as individuals. So I've outlined just a few leaves here. All the leaves with holes, this is feeding damage by the weevil on mile a minute weed. These intact leaves, this is arrow leafed terathum, Persicaria sagittata. This is in the same genus as myelaminate weed, but has a completely different chemical profile. So the weevil does not get the cues to feed or reproduce on this native plant. And this is part of the extensive testing process that I referenced earlier. So the weevil, uh, this insect spends its whole life cycle very closely tied to myelaminate. Eggs are laid on the stems, leaves, and developing flower heads. And when larvae emerge from the egg within about 10 minutes, they immediately find the first unoccupied node and bore into the stem. So their whole larval development takes place within the stem. Then they drop out of the stem to pupate, sometimes leaving pretty extensive uh, holes, sometimes smaller scarring. They pupate in the soil. And when the adults emerge, they're jet black. They get this rusty orange color from feeding on the vine. If you've worked with the plant, you'll be familiar with the way it stains your clothes in that color. So weevils have been released in all the states colored green here. And that release effort is largely thanks to production by the Philip Alampi Beneficial Insect Lab in New Jersey. Uh, we're approaching nearly 1 million weevils released in the US to date. These rearing and release efforts are critical because the weevil's about one to two millimeters long. It can disperse a little over four kilometers a year, which is pretty impressive for its size. But when we're talking about that distribution in the US, to get the weevils to the invasion front and help inoculate new populations with the biological control agent, that rearing effort is really beneficial. And uh, I will mention, we do know a fair amount about dispersal and the weevils are great at finding both small isolated patches of myelaminate and large populations, but the dispersal is habitat specific. And for example, if you get a canopy gap from say a tree fall and myelaminate colonizes that, that light gap, the weevil is very unlikely to move into the forest and attack that myelaminate weed. So how does the weevil impact the plant? Well, it's twofold. Uh, direct feeding on the developing seed clusters reduces both seed weight and viability. Indirect feeding by adults on the leaves, by larvae boring into the stems, reduces the overall vigor of the plant and the number of mature seeds and seeds per cluster. Again, with that six-year seed bank, this managing seed production is, is key. Early on in the program, we were hearing anecdotally that some people were waiting until they saw blue fruit to trigger implementing whatever chemical or mechanical management they chose for the weed. We were able to demonstrate that anywhere from 40 to 80% of these full-sized green fruits actually contained viable seed. So waiting until you see blue fruit present likely means that you're allowing viable seed to enter the seed bank in advance of uh, applying those management techniques. We conducted a number of experiments to try to get a better handle on interactions between the weevils and abiotic conditions. So for example, in this field experiment, we created these structures to 
provide full sun or shaded conditions. And this was a fully factorial experiment looking at weevil activity in the sun and shade. Weevils were excluded by applying a systemic insecticide. We know that weevils are attracted to light and they prefer mile a minute plants that were grown in full sun to those that were grown in the shade. The biomass of mile a minute was not surprisingly highest in the sun where weevils were excluded. And we found the highest density of weevils, their damage and their impact in the full sun conditions. We know that weevils can combine with other factors to stress the plant and limit seed production. For example, if you combine water, uh, limited water, like a simulated drought condition with weevils, you drastically reduce the number of seeds that the plant produces. And we see that during drought conditions in the field. So uh, these are data from one of the Brandywine Conservancy field sites, the laurels. In green, you'll see the percent cover of mile a minute weed. And in orange, the number of weevils per meter squared of mile a minute cover. So in the spring of 2005, we did a one-time release of 450 weevils. And you can see in that first year, weevil population was fairly low. There was robust cover at the site. By 2006 and seven, you see that weevil population is really growing and causing the mile a minute cover to start dropping off earlier in the season. And by 2008, we were really feeling pretty great about how things were going. Mile a minute cover never exceeded 20% in any of the plots in this site that year. And you see a kind of an oscillation in numbers between the weevil and the weed. And then 2009 came along and mile a minute just exploded on the landscape again. And it turned out we had a very cool wet spring followed by a cool summer in 2009. And that led us again to take a closer look at abiotic conditions and temperature dependent development. So this is a combination of data from uh, the lab and the field. In environmental chambers, we were able to demonstrate that a 10 degree difference in rearing conditions could lead to up to a 20 day difference in development time from egg to adult for the weevil. So we take this information and our determination of the lower developmental temperature threshold and apply growing degree days, which uh, you'll often see in terms of tracking pests in agriculture. So we were able to figure out that when weevils first emerged from overwintering or from pupation, 139 growing degree days were required for them to get through a pre oviposition period and start producing eggs. And another 358 days were required for them to actually complete development from egg to adult. So uh, 358 growing degree days development time. In southeastern Pennsylvania, where we were conducting this work, we would see three generations and a partial fourth generation under some field conditions. So we took what we knew about the weevil biology and conditions in the field. We collected weather data from local stations and applied the growing degree days and created a very simple model where we started each hypothetical population for 2008, nine and 10 on the same date with hundred weevils, applied those growing degree days to see what would happen. So sure enough, here's our first generation emerging in the field our second generation, our third generation. You can see the 2009 population is later in the year each year. And in fact, in 2010, when conditions were more favorable, we had a fourth generation emerge in mid-September. When we look at the total population growth, again, just based on 100 hypothetical starting population size, we see nearly a fourfold difference in the total number of weevils produced during optimal conditions in 2010 and unfavorable conditions in 2009. So the, the take home management message here is that a wet spring, a cool summer can result in increased mile a minute cover and limit weevil population growth, decreasing its efficacy and necessitating additional management techniques. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time here today talking about our integrated weed management efforts. So 
As we got more experience in the field, we started to see sites like this where we might have a few isolated seedlings that were being attacked by the weevils and competing with mostly native vegetation. But we also had sites like this where we got the mile and minute weed fairly under control only to have the invasive species treadmill effect take place. And in uh, the mid-Atlantic, our field sites typically ended up with mile and minute weed being replaced by Japanese stiltgrass, multiflora rose, and undesirable rubus species. So we conducted a series of experiments looking at the combination of biological control and competition. In this experiment, we isolated down to one mile a minute weed plant growing in the field in each of these cages. We trimmed the surrounding vegetation to a height of about 18 inches, and we inoculated the cages with different numbers of weevils. And you can see even the cage with only 10 weevils, by early August, 60% of those mile and minute weed plants were dead. And in the surviving plants, seed production was greatly delayed. So the mechanism here has to do with the way that the weevils impact plant architecture. Mile a minute does best when it can grow unchecked, get to the plant canopy, get all the light resources it needs, and it will seed prolifically. And that's aided by apical dominance. So it's only typically this one lead growing tip that's promoting vertical growth. When the weevils attack the plant, you tend to lose this apical dominance and start getting terminals shooting out of all the other nodes. So the end result is you get a much shorter, bushier plant that's not as able to compete for light resources. Additionally, weevil feeding in the stem can cause these nodes to stack up very close together drastically reducing the inner node length and again, the ability of the plant to grow vertically. So we tried to combine all of this information into several integrated weed management experiments that actively included a restoration planting component. So this first experiment was conducted by Kiri Wallace, uh, again, fully factorial with weevils present and absent and in this case, Kiri used a native seed mix that consisted of warm and cool season grasses and an annual and a perennial forb. And you can get a visual of how these plots change over time from a monoculture of mile and minute weed to a more diverse plant community in 2011. And if we look at that from the perspective of species richness, you can see that the highest number of native plant species were present in the plots that integrated the weevils and the seed mix. There were twice as many natives in those plots as the no seed mix, no weevil plots. And this wasn't just because of the five plants in the seed mix. We found in both of these restoration projects that the planting component seemed to stabilize the situation and facilitate colonization colonization by other native plants. The other integrated weed management experiment was part of my PhD work. And in this case, we have four treatments, a control, a low density planting of Euthamia graminifolia, grass-leaved goldenrod, which is a pretty aggressive native, a high density planting of the goldenrod, and a combination of the goldenrod and 25 elm tree seedlings that were tolerant of Dutch elm disease. We prepped the sites with herbicide and planted them in the fall of 2008. The following spring, the plots were divided in half and one half was randomly treated with the pre-emergent herbicide prodiamine. Weevils were already present, but we supplemented the population at the sites. So about a year after planting, you can see the high density goldenrod plots clearly had goldenrod. The control plots were a mixture largely of mile a minute and Japanese stiltgrass. And in our elm planting, you can actually get a sense of where the spray line was, because on the left side of the plot, you can see elm trees emerging. On the right side, they're struggling to make it through the mile a minute and the stilt grass. I'm going to show a couple slides where we have the planting treatments on the x-axis. Here we're looking at seedling counts in the spring. And you can see in 2009, the year we applied the pre-emergent, we did still have seedlings uh, that went, emergent went down after germination had started, but there were significantly fewer mile a minute seedlings in the herbicide compared to the no herbicide plots. And even though this was a one-time treatment, that 
significant difference in seedlings between the herbicide and no herbicide plots persisted through 2011. If we look at the uh, response of the plant community, we collaborated with a local botanist, surveyed the plots, identified everything to species and estimated cover. And you can see there were significantly higher total native plant cover in the plots that were treated with the pre-emergent herbicide. In fact, if we compare our treatments, so here we've integrated pre-emergent herbicide and biological control. Here we've added a planting component to those others, and we see significantly higher native plant cover. So the combination of these treatments decreased mile a minute cover, it reduced reinvasion by Japanese stiltgrass, and it promoted the native plant community. If we look at Euthamia graminifolia, surprisingly low cover for this pretty aggressive native when there was no pre-emergent present. And again, Japanese stiltgrass really dominated plots where we did not apply the pre-emergent herbicide. We unexpectedly had the opportunity to get back into these plots in 2012 and 15. Interestingly, that herbicide effect was still significant by 2012. It was no longer significant by 2015, but you can see six years after that initial treatment, how low those mile a minute seedling numbers were in the plots. So overall, we were feeling pretty great about things in 2010, 2011. Uh, this is an image from the laurels, which had great native plant cover, including a lot of grass leaved goldenrod that we had not planted. And when we take a look at those plots and the limited plant surveys in 2015, at the laurels, we see mile a minute started to creep its way back in, although not in the elm plots where it was being shaded out. Those spring seedlings translated into some cover in the fall. Euthamia graminifolia was almost non-existent, which was quite a surprise. At Waterloo Mills, Kevin's Preserve, essentially no mile a minute seedlings, no mile a minute cover in the fall. Euthamia graminifolia was still present, but not dominant, and there was no Japanese stiltgrass. And at Crosslands, there were mile a minute seedlings, but no cover in the fall because Japanese stiltgrass had really resurged in those plots. So I think the biggest challenge for land managers is the need for adaptive management, that these sites will vary and management must be customized accordingly. And just in these three sites, we saw pretty different trajectories over those three years, with one site requiring no additional management another site being invaded by Japanese stiltgrass. We actually recommended uh, application of a grass specific herbicide in that meadow because there were very few native grasses present. And another site has an uptick in mile a minute weed. So our, our take home lessons are uh, a portion of that green fruit contains viable seed and should be managed accordingly. We know mile a minute will produce more seed in the sun versus the shade and that the weevils will be more effective in sunny habitats. We know they're not likely to colonize mile a minute patches and forestry gap, canopy gaps, so those situations should be managed differently, and that a wet spring and cool summer can decrease the weevil population growth and its efficacy throughout the growing season, necessitating additional management. There are way too many people to thank individually, although I, I will thank Dick Reardon from the US Forest Service for his years of support and funding. And as Judy likes to say, the, the many field sites and land managers who donated their mile and minute weed to science and helped with uh, the design and implementation of this work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, thanks for everyone who's been entering questions into the chat. Um, what we're hoping to do is to have an integrated Q&A session with Alan and Kevin after Kevin has an opportunity to talk about um, his management experience at the Brandywine Conservancy. Um, so keep those questions coming. We're keeping track of them. Um, and then we'll have a conversation in just a little bit. Um, so Kevin, I am going to ask you to unmute yourself. There you go. Perfect. And I am going to screen share your document. Um, so you let me know when you want me to scroll to a different page, okay? Sure, yeah, first page is just the map, so we'll start there. Perfect. All right, everyone. So next we have um, Kevin Freiberger joining us from the Brandywine Conservancy in Pennsylvania. 
Correct. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate that. And Ellen, thank you. I love hearing the, the stories. It's, it's always fascinating to hear the, you know, more and more of the data that you guys have been able to come up with. But uh, just a little bit of background. I work for the Brandywine Conservancy, <clears throat> and we are a small southeastern Pennsylvania based in Chester County. Uh, I oversee most of the nature preserves that the Conservancy owns. The one that we have on the map is actually Waterloo Mills Preserve, and it was one of the field sites where Ellen and Kiri did some of their research work. This is a small 170 acre property compared to some of the other properties that we do have. And I've actually been fortunate enough to be here almost 21 years. So I've seen quite a bit of changes over the years. Um, if you do look at this map, what, you'll, what you will notice is there are quite a bit of different habitat types and it really lends itself to mile a minute because if you notice a lot of the field edges their ecotones is one of the sites that it is very um, suitable to this area. Historically this was an area that was grazed pretty heavily by, by uh, cattle so there was quite a bit of disturbance in some Yaga woodlands <clears throat> so the edges are where we did have quite a bit of Japanese stillgrass and mile a minute but what we do for our properties, uh, we have three primary goals. Uh, the goal is to manage for the natural resources, to promote education, and also to facilitate research. So partnering with the University of Delaware and Ellen <clears throat> really ticked off all three of those goals and it was really a fun project to work with. Um, if you do wanna go on to the next slide, I'm gonna really just jump right into it. What I have experienced over the years is it, it is a relatively, Matt Mile a Minute itself is a relatively easy um, plant to control as long as you remain uh, consistent and the perpetual, you have to be perpetual with the maintenance. Um, I, I jumped right into a herbicide approach. There's traditionally three different times of, ma of management. You can do mechanical, you can do manual or herbicide. On the scale that I'm dealing with on all of the preserves that we have in this one and this property as well, it's, it's really just not practical to go and pull everything by hand. And I've also learned the hard way by mowing and weed whacking is not that effective and, and on the scale that we're dealing with. So the chemical approach was really what um, seems to be the most effective approach. And as you notice, what I did is I just literally uh, went right to the pre-emergent application. With Ellen's project and Brian O'Neill who do dirt treatments, they use prodiamine, which is another really good product. But over the years, we've been able to, to um, work with other herbicides. And what I've been doing for the last 15 years is I'm having incredible success with, as you see on the map, uh, I use Pendulum Aquacat. I'm doing that at usually late March, early April, depending on the weather, depending on the season. But um, this is the approach that I've taken where I have a tremendous amount of success. Uh, coincidentally, it also works quite well with myelin or uh, with Japanese stillgrass too. So uh, what I'll do is I'll do backpack applications or four-wheeler ATV applications in areas where I have high densities. And it is, um, it's a really, really good way to help me get a head start on the, on the traditional growing season. Because, you know, once mile a minute is 10, 15, 20 foot tall, it's a lot more, a lot more difficult to manage. So the pre-emergent approach is what I have found to be the most successful way to actually manage that population. Going down to the post-emergent, if there are plants that you do find popping up, um, as Ellen indicated during her talk, we actually get a lot of canopy gaps. We have some younger woodlands and we are just getting inundated with really bad storms in the mid-Atlantic region. So we have a lot of canopy gaps occurring. And when we do that, we get mile a minute popping up into those areas. You also then don't really necessarily get rhinocomalus or the weevils popping into the site. So treating them as a post-emergent uh, is, is another good product or as another good approach. And the product plateau or the active ingredient of Mazapic is what I have found to be very successful in controlling the post-emergent application for a mile a minute. So the combination of the pre-emergent with pendulum and then the post-emergent with plateau is, is pretty much foolproof. And I've been able to really significantly reduce the, we, the mile a minute that we do have on the property. Now, these two approaches in conjunction with the weevil, we've pretty much been able to really reduce it uh, on our properties. Now, you know, we have a lot of neighboring properties as well. So you do, um, you do get influx from time to time, but you know, the perpetual maintenance and just follow-up is, is imperative to make sure that you're controlling it. 
Um, what I did want to do is I, I took those photographs. This was in late August. And I don't know if they're really showing up pretty well, but the image on the left is actually a, is three days after I did a post-emergent application with Plateau. But the key takeaway, what I wanted to show you is um, the selectivity of the products that we're working with. Uh, you can already, see, if you look at that photograph, you can see the, the vine is already brown and withered. Uh, senescence has already occurred. But what you're noticing, there are a lot of native species um, that are present there. Amphicarpa one is one of the hog peanuts that we do get quite a bit. It's growing there and it's still doing quite well. There's white snake root, there's there's a pile wart, which is a really sort of an opportunistic plant that we get that establish itself after, after disturbances. So the treatment that I did on the left um, shows you the, the selectivity of the herbicide and how we minimize disturbances by just targeting the mile a minute plant itself. On the right is a couple of days later, and there's a couple of other species that are growing there that are all native. So the selectivity of the product is why I recommend <clears throat> like Plateau and then also Pendulum Aquacap. Now, if you want to go to the third image, um, Jenica. So this is this is quite typical in areas that has that has not been treated. This was another one of our properties that I just wanted to show everyone. It's a traditional, you know, woodland edge. The main vine in the middle is actually grapevine, vitus, which is one of our native vines. But I did do a treatment here two days prior to, and you can already see the base, the base of the vine starting to uh, change color. But in the, in the background, you have our native blackberry, which is Allegheny blackberry. And in the foreground in the bottom right, there's actually uh, one of the beggar's ticks. So the, the herbicide application is affecting, isn't, isn't affecting any of the native species that we have there. And it's being quite selective with targeting the mile a minute vine itself. And, and that vine was completely brown within another day and a half. Um, and then if you go to the last image, Jenica, this, this is an image that really complements what Ellen was talking about. And it shows the combination of approach that we tackle. Uh, the feeding damage from the weevil itself, and you can actually see the node damage too. But we are, but I also did a, a, a treatment, a post-emergent treatment on this plant. So the weevils, in addition to the treatment, is is um, absolutely killing this plant 100. But it's actually growing on pilewort, which is another one of our native, which is a native plant that we have. Um, so we found the most success with doing this very selective pre and post-emergent applications and, and minimizing the amount of disturbance. You know, historically, I would go in and mow an entire woodland edge, but that just created more of an opportunity and avenue for these plants to establish themselves. Um, the time I mentioned up in the you know prior to that, the timing is very important, and Ellen had mentioned the viability of the seeds when they were green, and we definitely noticed that in the field, and even with herbicide treatments, when we're treating. Um, when you have that, the, the seed clusters just starting to develop, those seeds were still developing. So in southeastern PA, we are targeting sometime around early August to mid-August for treatments for post-emergent for the greatest success. And uh, the last page is just my contact information. But I was really hoping to have a, you know, an open dialogue with a lot of questions in the field. But that is, that's the approach that, we, that I have taken. Over over the last you know two decades, and I've had a lot of success on all of our properties with the post and pre-emergent applications. So, thanks so much, Kevin, for sharing that very on the ground experience and actually echoing some of the things that Ellen was sharing from the research findings as well, and sort of augmenting that with um, with the the larger scale application. So that was that was great. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in for both Alan and Kevin. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share um, and then go ahead and start asking some of these questions. Um, and so there, there are a number that are focused around um, herbicide questions. Um, and so I might start there. Um, so the first question is, um, this came in during Ellen's talk and Kevin, maybe you've kind of covered this, but what's the active ingredient in the pre-emergent? And so Ellen, were you using the same pre-emergent that Kevin was talking about? The applicator that we contacted with uh, sprayed a pre-emergent prodiamine. So that is different from what Kevin was using. Yeah. <clears throat> so, well, if I can elaborate the three, Please. the three pre-emergent 
um, ingredients that we have found successful are prodiamine, which Ellen had mentioned, that's what Brian O'Neill treated for her. And then we actually use pendulum aquacap and plateau. So we found success with all three of those herbicide treatments as a pre-emergent. Okay, great. Um, and maybe we should back up and say, for those who aren't familiar, the pre-emergent is applied before germination starts. So the weed comes into contact with the herbicide as it starts to germinate and imbibe water. That's when it, it comes into contact with the pre-emergent herbicide. Yep, thanks for that clarification, Alan. Um, and actually kind of related to what you just said, um, Kevin, you had mentioned that the, the application time for your pre-emergent varies a little bit from year to year based on the weather of that particular year. Can you fill folks in on what you're actually looking for, um, for how you decide when to start applying? Uh, I'm actually looking for seedling germination. Uh, mm -hmm. I have found that if I don't have seedling germination, um, I'm still well within that narrow window to be able to do my treatments. So a month, you know, three weeks prior to germination is when I find that that window really works for me. And for us in this time of year, it's for this, this area location, it's, it's generally a late March, early April application. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if you see a warming trend, early April would probably be a little late, but we've had some cooler spring, so I'm able to get away with a little bit later window. So I'm actually looking for germination of the seedlings. Okay, great. And that's if really they cool. are present, that's too late. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, yeah, and I, I would say if anyone is um, interested in asking questions themselves, I'm sort of working my way through these questions. Um, you can always uh, sort of use the raise your hand icon. Um, we do have multiple pages of folks. I can't see everyone. Um, so if you could just put a quick note in the chat that I'd like to ask a question, um, then we can... Um, have you asked the questions directly as well. So, um, and sort of to, to wrap up um, what I think are, are the kind of herbicide related questions, um, really there's a couple that are around specificity. Um, and so what other plant classes um, or particular species, if you wanna mention them, um, are, would be affected by the pre-emergence that you're applying? For, for the pendulum aquacap, what, I'm, what we find in the field is it's actually relatively selective and strangely enough, the two targeted plants that we are trying to control, still, Japanese stillgrass and mild minute is what it controls. It's a sort of, a, and they're the annuals, they're the annuals that we're having most of the problems with. Um, coincidentally, I found with plateau, you get some other ancillary non-target kills if it's a little bit later in the season. Um, we have cardamony, which is another big herbaceous plant that we have a problem with in this area. So it actually helps to control that. Um, but what I have found in the woodlands and the woodland edges where we're treating, the native plants that come back are Muhlenbergii, are uh, Lyrzea. There's a lot of the, the native, native perennial grasses that we have that persist. And even clover, or um, yeah. Clo there's clover, and we're getting a lot of other native species. Um, violets is the other one that I'm, I'm noticing, but it also doesn't doesn't target any of the fern species. If we have Christmas fern, like polystichum or anything else that grows in that area, it's not affecting that. So the selectivity with a lot of the the, um, the annuals is what it's really lim limiting to. Mm -hmm. Great, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, and this sort of transition us. To, to talking about biocontrol as well, um, is there any um, sort of cross effects between the herbicide and the weevil directly? Um, I would expect not because we're talking herbicides versus um, insects, but um, have you ever observed that in the places where you've applied the herbicide that you, it seems like the weevil populations are negatively affected in any way? We have not directly observed that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're talking about this integrated pest management, Ellen, that you were talking about where weevils plus pre-emergent seem like they're quite effective, um, it seems like they really do sort of bolster each other rather than offset each other. And, 
they're 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 a wonderful complement to each other and we find in the field it, 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 you very rarely are able to spray everything in every plant so what's missed or what's omitted or neighboring properties is where the weevils are actually helping to control sites so the combination really helps to target those those areas mm -hmm. I, so I will I say, it, sorry kev no you're fine go ahead I'd say where we are likely get to get mortality would be, let's say there are larvae developing in the stem that don't have enough time to complete their development before the treated plant dies. Uh, but we're certainly not seeing uh, extensive problems with adult weevils mm -hmm. and mobility being the, the chief advantage there. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Um, so we actually had a very um, practical question about biocontrol, which is how do I get weevils? Just wait, they'll be there. <laughs> yeah, um, on that note, in surveys in, in New Jersey, uh, which is where that rearing lab is based, um, they, they have not found a site recently that did not have weevils present already when they get there. Um, and that certainly has been the case in a lot of the survey work we've done in southeastern Pennsylvania. That won't necessarily be the case further north or in more of the extreme populations. And uh, you can request weevils from the Philip Alampi lab or reach out to invasive uh, species managers at the state level that might have those contacts. Um, other states, including Maryland, do some of their own rearing at this point, but it, it does vary state to state. Great, thanks a lot. And Nancy, you had your hand up, Nancy Olmsted. Yeah, thanks, Jenica. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question about the timing of the um, pre-emergent herbicide, Kevin. Uh, did you say that you are trying to apply the pre-emergent three to four weeks before you see seedlings? Was that what I understood? Or are you saying you apply the pre-emergent at the time of seedling emergence? No, for effectiveness, you want to apply prior to any emergence. Um, so I'm, I'm applying three to four weeks before I'm noticing any germination. Great, thank you. And so I'm gonna take us in a slightly different direction, um, but deer browse is a, a very real problem in the Northeastern states. And Kevin, I don't know if you've got that large of a problem as well, um, but do either of you have some perspective on how deer browse fits into this whole, um, management strategy? Would it promote mile a minute, you know, help to eradicate? Um, does it interact with the biocontrol or the herbicide applications? Deer will definitely browse the seed. We know there is a, a slight sugar content to the fruit. Um, picking mile a minute seed out of deer scat was definitely not the highlight of my graduate experience, <laughs> uh, but they, they certainly are contributing to, uh, to spread of the seed and, and fertilizing the seed as they move it. So yet another dispersal vector. There you go. Sounds like. Kevin, Ooh. you want to add to that? The only, well, you know, we do see foraging, absolutely, um, of the seeds themselves. So there is dispersals, and we actually do do find clusters in the middle of woodlands from deer scat. Um, the only effect, long-term effect, I would say, was just their herbivory effect. You know, when we're treating mile a minute and other plants, you, you don't get this the traditional succession that you would be having with some of the shrub, you know, shrubs or wildflowers that you would traditionally look for. So you're getting a little bit more selective regrowth in areas that was that was treated and stuff that is just in the woodlands where we're doing treatments, we get white snake root. So that's kind of one of the only plants that we're having, we're losing some of the diversity. So that would be the only effect that deer I could see having in the long term. Mm -hmm. and so Ellen, a lot of your work is, is really focused, on, at least experimentally focused on augmenting those native communities. Um, Kevin, is that something that you've used as um, a, an approach to restoring the areas where you've treated, or do you have enough um, kind of local seed bank that even though deer brows might overlay, you know, what's able to come back and what's not, that you've got enough diversity that um, that augmentation doesn't seem necessary? I, I find it to be site specific. Um, one of the things that I've learned over the years is to really sort of minimize disturbance. So if I do have an area where I'm getting a lot of regeneration occurring, I'm really not going to go in and introduce native species from a restoration standpoint. But larger scale control, we definitely will do restoration on, the, on a larger scale. And then 
have follow-up treatments for herbicides to keep, you know, to, to control that. So um, it, it's kind of site specific, but we do, we do generally have enough seed dormancy of native species that once they're established, they can maintain and manage themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a clarifying question come in. Um, I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, it says, you mentioned a couple times um, that, well, this person says, we treat before we even see green seeds. Um, what, the th what would the thought process be behind um, waiting to treat until after that? So I guess waiting until you saw um, sort of blue coloration. Is that folks that just aren't quite sure about the life cycle or is there some other reason why folks would, would wait until that point to treat? Uh, I'll field that and Kevin, correct me if you disagree. Um, I think early on it was just an assumption that the seeds were not viable until the fruit changed color. I, I'll completely agree. You know, when we yeah. started originally treating it, when you thought you, you harvested the green seeds or you controlled the green seeds, you thought you were treating it, but then we noticed that they were viable at that early stage. Um, so when we're treating in the field, even if I do begin to see flowers or those really early seeds, it, it's in, in essence too late for us. And then we'll switch to just, you know, bagging and collecting the seeds, or we'll just move on to another and, and sacrifice that site for a year. So I, I think it was, the, you know, an assumption that people could get away with treating it when they were green, which is not the case. Okay, great. Well, thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, doing a quick scan through to see if there are any other questions that I've missed. Um, Abby, have you caught anything that I haven't touched on? Yeah, there was one question about the economic importance of myeliminate. That would be Thank interesting you. to talk about. So is there an economic impact of myeliminate, I think is the question. I would say that um, that is kind of one of the problems with all of these invasive weeds in natural areas. How do you assign an economic value to the damage they're causing? I mean, you can quantify the amount of herbicide you have to buy to manage them on a given site, but you know, in terms of uh, the impacts they're having on native communities and um, ecological function, that's, that's what's so difficult to quantify those intangibles. And I, I will say that there is becoming, a, there's a trend of an increasing effort in biological control programs in general to partner with economists, try to assign values to these ecological processes and get a better idea of the long-term impact. Um, I will say if you look from the limited perspective that we tend to be able to take that biological control programs that are successful tend to be incredibly economically favorable in that even though there's a long-term process in investing in finding and testing the agent to get approval, long-term, you know, they're self-perpetuating in the field and you can get an economic return of easily 10 to 30 times every dollar invested long-term in a successful program. That sounds like a pretty good economic argument to yeah. me. It's a pretty good ROI. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that though. And I, you know, I, I think that is one of the challenges that we come up against some of the time is that um, if the impacts are, are not directly on a crop um, or something that is in the trade, then it becomes harder to quantify exactly what that, what that effect is. Kevin, it sounded like you were about to say something. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's one of the biggest threats to our region's biodiversity. So traditionally up front, the economic cost is very high, very high for maintenance. And, you know, we keep talking about the need for perpetual maintenance. And in theory, every year, you know, every succeeding year is less and less work and less herbicide, less manpower. Um, but there's a, there's a high economic cost. And I know there, there, are, there was a study that was done recently in Southeastern PA trying to quantify the number. And I haven't seen any results from that, but I, I concur that it's, it's, it's significantly high, not only from an economical perspective, but from ecological too. So. Mm -hmm. um, so a few more questions. Um, so this is from Juliana. Um, does weevil introduction cause a delay in flowering or fruiting of the mile a minute? Our sites were very slow to flower this season and they did have weevil damage. <laughs> 
that is definitely one of the impacts that the weevils can have. And if you're limiting overall vine growth from that damage, you're limiting access to uh, light resources and that hopefully you know, carries forward to limiting overall fruiting. Great, thank you. Um, and then two questions um, about prescribed fire um, and whether that is a viable control technique for myelin in it or whether you've ever heard anyone using it. Kevin, you wanna field that one first? Thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, I can, anecdotally, um, I, I have not used prescribed fire, but there are some sister organizations close to us that have Longwood Gardens and Delaware Nature Society, and they do still have myelin in, in areas that have been burned. It's an opportunistic plant. So I think if you reduce some of the competition, it's gonna seize that opportunity to grow there. The, fi the fires that you get here don't traditionally generate enough heat to actually really scar the seed, the seed coat. So you're still gonna have viability of those seeds. And then you're just reducing the competition by getting rid of that thatch. But that's anecdotally, because I haven't, from what I've seen in the field, I haven't done any real research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have direct experience with fire either, but I'll echo what Kevin said. And, you know, when you see that vine die back in the fall, there's really nothing to it. So that definitely has been a discussion about whether there's even enough tinder for the fire to burn hot enough in a big mile a minute patch to, to generate killing temperatures. Great, well, thanks for that perspective. Um, I think we've got one last question so far. Um, sort of what the, the ability of licensed applicators versus homeowners might be in terms of accessing and using the pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides you've been talking about. So, uh, I, well, I, I, can, I am a certified applicator. Um, most of the products that we've suggested or that I've recommend using it, you have to have a commer commercial applicator's license. They're not traditionally available over the counter. Um, I started working with a small, a small, um, there was a small company down here called Weeds Incorporated and that's exactly what they do full time. They go do treatments for homeowners, small organizations, large organizations, they can do any different scale. Uh, there may be them popping up in the New England, or, you know, the New England region. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but it's. I, I would highly recommend if anybody is going to do some home treatments, just to get an applicator's license, so you really understand the basic, you know, treatment approach. Um, a lot of people generally want to simplify it and then just put, you know, certain number of ounces per gallon. You just go treat their backyard when they're really saturating the plant, saturating the soil, and it's just ineffective. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's an approach to calibrating your equipment and using the right herbicide. So I would recommend getting, either getting an, um, an applicator's license or, re or reaching out to someone who has that treatment. Generally in the long term, it's gonna be a lot cheaper to hire someone to do it and a lot more effective from what I found. But yeah, yeah these are products that you traditionally can't buy over the counter. Yep, and we also had a response um, from Nancy Olmstead on the chat that says that the herbicide laws really vary from state to state. Um, and so it's hard to give a, a blanket answer to this question, but I think Kevin, your, your suggestion that, you know, making sure that you really understand what you're applying, why you're applying it, and that you're applying it correctly. Um, sort of agree. ring true no matter where you are. Yeah, it, it, I completely agree. It's site specific and it's species specific. So I don't have, you know, I put a, a blanket approach to the herbicides for this talk because it was what I found to be most effective. But I think, you know, it, it's always species specific and it's spices, site specific how we deal with our approach. So mm -hmm. I'll let you rehearse the sentiments, yes. Um, and then we have, I, I think we have time for one more question and then we will thank you so much for your contributions. Um, Meredith asks, are you aware of any power companies in Pennsylvania or I suppose elsewhere um, doing any mile, mile a minute management along power line right of ways um, because they seem to be great areas for regional spread? Um, I mean, uh, yeah, again, I, I'll tackle that. I do know uh, Penn State Extension. There's an individual, Art Gover. Uh, he does. Uh, he's contracted a lot to do to, to do broad spectrum treatments on power lines. 
Um, the one gentleman that I mentioned, Brian O'Neill, his company, we think they, they're contracted by the state to do right of ways. They do treatment of, um, you know, of train tracks and those, those right of ways in those corridors. So they're doing that. Um, so they're, and they're trying to specify the approach. Traditionally, a lot of the power companies would just do a blanket herbicide application and just fry everything. So um, Art Gover from Penn State Extension has really developed an approach to be a lot more methodical with the herbicides that you're using. You're only targeting the problem plants, you know, whether it's olive, whether it's Japanese stillgrass or mile a minute. So they're being a lot more specific with their approach and methodical, which in the long term is beneficial for everyone. And do you happen to know if they're using biocontrol in conjunction? It sounds like you're, you're saying that they're using herbicides, um, but do you know if they're also using a biocontrol approach? I, I, I don't know that. I know some have experimented with, you know, with goat foraging. Um, I know there's been some experiments with other different types, but I think, you know, going back to that cost effective approach, I think it's a lot simpler and easier just to go treat, you know, that whole extensive corridor um, with a truck or with a, a four-wheeler than it is. But I can, um, if it's in Pennsylvania, there are, the weevils are there already. And mm -hmm. They're doing a substantial damage, but, you know, I don't know if Ellen mentioned this, but the weevils don't, are, they're not going to completely eradicate the, the vine itself. I think the combination of approaches is what's really going to reduce the seed bank. So. Yep, that was certainly one of the messages I took from Ellen's talk was that this combination of biocontrol plus um, herbicide really is um, is one of the the primary strategies that's going to get us from you know infestation to something that's more under control. Um, the other thing that I feel like I'm taking away from both of your talks is just that this it's not a one time management um, application. It's a you need to keep revisiting these locations and then adapting what you're doing to how the situation changes over time. Um, which I feel like are, are great lessons for any species, um, but feels especially true for, for Mile a Minute. So with that, um, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you to everyone who joined us today um, and asking lots of really great questions. Um, I hope that you've gotten many of them answered. Um, and thanks also to Kevin and Ellen uh, for providing your expertise to this group. We are very grateful to have you with us today.